Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. Good evening, I'm Yvonne Stapp, and welcome to Contemporary Science Issues and Innovations. Tonight, we welcome one of the best medical journalists in the country, Robert Whitaker. Bob Whitaker is best known for his widely acclaimed books on mental illness in the United States and on issues about psychiatric drugs. The first of these books, Mad in America, was named by Discover Magazine as one of the best science books of 2002. His second book on medical issues, Anatomy of an Epidemic, was published in 2010, and that book was named the 2010 Best Investigative Book by the Reporters and Editors Association. This wide recognition has made Robert Whitaker a major resource on the subject. Prior to writing books, Bob Whitaker was a prize-winning science and medical reporter in New York. He received a George Polk Award for Medical Writing and a National Association of Science Writers Award, and he was a finalist for the 1998 Pulitzer Prize. In two other presentations for Science for the Public, Bob Whitaker discussed the long-term, often negative, effects of psychotropic drugs due to the complex interaction between these medications and the chemistry of the brain. Recent reports in the New York Times and elsewhere have provided examples of potentially serious consequences of drugs prescribed now for Attention Deficit Hyperactive Disorder, ADHD. Such reports remind us of Whitaker's efforts to caution the public and the medical community. Tonight, Bob Whitaker explains how ADHD is diagnosed, how the drugs work, and why they can be very dangerous. This information is very important not only for parents, but for the many individuals who take these medications in order to just improve concentration. Bob Whitaker is a great public ad advocate. Do read his excellent books. They're available in public libraries and view his previous lectures for science for the public on our website. It is a very special honor to welcome him back tonight. Welcome, Bob. I just want to thank you for having me here tonight. It's a real pleasure. Um, we're going to have a very focused talk because we're just going to talk about this one thing, a brief history of ADHD, how the diagnosis arose, what we've learned about the biology of, of ADHD, how the drugs affect the brain, and we're, then we're going to do a quick review through the outcomes literature and just see what science has told us about how medications affect basically children over both the short term and the long term. So it'll very, be a very sort of focused talk. Now if we go back to um, ADHD. Before it first enters as a diagnosis in the a American Psychiatric Association's uh, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual in 1980. That's when they published DSM-3. Prior to this time, we had something called minimal brain dysfunction with children that sometimes was being uh, treated with stimulants. But it really takes off with 1980 when we get the first, the first diagnosis, we call it attention deficit disorder. Now one thing that's important to know is when they did DSM-3, they were, this whole sort of categorization, categorization of mental disorders was basically done to further research. They said, we're gonna group people with certain symptoms together, and then hopefully, by gr grouping people together, we can validate these disorders. We can find the etiology, and we can find common to understand the clinical course. But the important thing is, it was a construct. It was gonna say, we're gonna group people, these children who have trouble maybe paying attention, move about too much in classroom, we're going we're gonna to put them into a category and we're going to call it attention deficit disorder and hopefully over the next 20, 30 years we're going to understand about perhaps the etiology of this disorder, what might be causing it, and we'll be able to do, do research on the treatments, et cetera. But it is a construct, okay? Now, in 1987 we got um, the, a revised uh, version of the DSM-3, it's called DM-3R, and now they renamed this Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. That expanded the boundaries of kids that could be grouped into that a bit more. Now the key, I think, to understanding, and what are the symptoms? Difficulty paying attention, you move about classroom, you're sort of a classroom distur disturbance sometimes, talk too much in class, 
a lot of fidgety, that sort of thing. And these are the, the symptoms that are used to make the diagnosis. Now one of the key things here is this, and you'll see here from the Harvard Review of Psychiatry, this diagnosis generally arises from behavior in the classroom. And you'll see that often the kids are brought to, say, a psychiatrist, and the kid does not actually display hyperactive symptoms in the, in, the, in the doctor's office or often even at home. So really, in many ways, the diagnosis arises from a failure to thrive, so to speak, in the classroom. That's really what we're talking about. Now, there is one really interesting study that was done by Canadian researchers recently, and they show that the younger children in the class are more likely to be diagnosed with ADHD than the older children in the class. There's an, a notable increased risk. And obviously that may be, have to do with maturity levels of the children that's, that are playing at this time. And how about the prevalence of this? Well, the, the amount of children being diagnosed keeps going up and up. The latest CDC figures, that's the Center for Disease Control, say that about 10% of American children between 2007 and 2009 were diagnosed with ADHD. And for boys during that period, it was about 13%, probably a little bit higher than that now. Now, that does not mean that all these children have been uh, medicated, but it means that's sort of the prevalence that we're seeing in the United States. And obviously, it's increasing quite a bit. Now, one of the things we've heard in the United States is that we now know this is a brain disease, that these brains are different if the children are so diagnosed. And they'll say, well, we have scans showing this to be so. Well, if you actually dig into the science, that's not quite accurate. So if we look at the history to find the etiology or the pathology or something distinct about the ADHD brain, you can see what they find. In 1991, after about a decade, they say, we're just not finding this abnormality in the neuroanatomy. Anatomy. 1997, you'll see in the textbook of neuropsychiatry, they look to see, well, maybe the problem with ADHD is there's a chemical imbalance in the brain. And the thought was, well, maybe since stimulants up dopamine activity, maybe the problem with ADHD kids is they have too low amounts of dopamine. But they did not find that to be so. And this is why I actually brought these slides tonight. I want you to see that it's not me saying this. It's these reputable. Uh, organization, scientific organizations that are coming to these conclusions. It's not me. You see that the NIH, that's the National Institute of Health, they did a conference on this in 1998, and you'll see after years of looking to see if we can find a, 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 a distinct etiology with kids so diagnosed, we just haven't found it. The causes remain unknown. Now, since that time, we've done, you know, the MRIs have come on, uh, PET scans, et cetera, and so there's a lot of ways to measure basically brain volumes in the brain, volumes of different uh, areas of the brain, and you've often heard now that children with ADHD might have different volumes in certain areas of the brain. But here's the problem with that research. You'll see the first quote, these changes are not of significant magnitude to be useful to make a diagnosis, okay? And by the way, these are always averages. So you take 30 kids and then you average the brain volume and you, you do that against a, a, another group of, quote, typically developing controls and there might be some slight difference in size. But those are aggregate averages is what they're doing. But here's the key thing. And this has just came out. This is by the American Psychiatric Association. They say, we don't know even these small differences in volumes we're seeing are they due to the drug or are they due to the di disorder? So here we are in 2012, and you'll say they say, to our knowledge, no controlled trials have examined the effect of stimulant medication on structural brain abnormalities in youth with ADHD. So we don't know which is the difference. Is it due to the drug or is it, in fact, um, native, so to speak, or organic to these children? Now, I will tell you this problem, this confound, runs throughout all imaging studies in psychiatry, whether it be a people diagnosed with schizophrenia, bipolar, et cetera. Really, you're seeing people who've been on medications, often multiple medications, being diagnosed, I mean, being uh, scanned. And we really do not know if it's the drug or the disease or both. And just a real quick aside in terms of why we have to be cautious about this. For a long time, they were saying that schizo in schizophrenia patients, you see a decline in brain volumes, OK? And they say that's a disease process. And this was done by a, a well-known researcher named Nancy Andreessen. The problem is when they gave these class of drugs, antipsychotics, to monkeys, it shrank their brain. Okay? And now, eventually, she, it, there was a number of studies done that really sought to look at, is it the disease or the drug? And Nancy Andreessen in 2011 said the shrinkage is associated with the drug, 
and it's not associated with the severity of illness. So it, it's, it's just a cautionary tale. When we start saying these kids have abnormal brains because of these scans, we really don't know if it's native to them or it's the drug. Okay? And it's just a cautious. So now the next question we want to say is this. And again, one of the hopes of this talk is to sort of dig beneath the common sort of stories told about ADHD and really see what science is telling us. So there is sometimes a sense to the public uh, that, that you'll hear this phrase. This is a brain disease and it's like diabetes and the drug is like insulin for diabetes and so of course you're going to give stimulants to the kids. Wouldn't you give insulin to a diabetic? So for example, that was what was mentioned in the New York Times a while back. But in that metaphor, you have a known pathology, right, with diabetes. There's an insulin deficiency and so you're replacing that. Here what you just saw was that we don't know the etiology, so there's nothing that, that is known to be fixed. So now we have to ask then how do the drugs act on the brain <clears throat> and that they're not fixing a known chemical imbalance and how does the brain respond to the drug. So what are stimulants? Stimulants basically up dopamine activity in the brain and dopamine is a neurotransmitter. It's a molecule that communicates between neurons and here's how neurotransmitters work. You have a presynaptic neuron that releases that molecule into a tiny gap between neurons which we call the synaptic cleft. Then that molecule binds with receptors on the receiving neuron, which we call the postsynaptic neuron. We say that molecule fits like a, a key into a lock, and that's how the messages pass between neurons. Now think about this. The brain rele this neuron releases this molecule into the synaptic cleft. What does it have to do to end that message, end that signaling? It's got to remove the dopamine from that synaptic cleft, and it does so in one of two ways. Either the dopamine is metabolized and it's carted off, the metabolites are carted off as waste, or the dopamine is brought back up into the presynaptic neurons, okay? So what does methylphenidate do? Methylphenidate blocks the reuptake of dopamine into the presynaptic neuron, so dopamine stays longer in the synaptic cleft, that's why it is said to up dopaminergic activity, all right? It blocks that normal reuptake process, acts as an accelerator on dopamine transmission. Now the brain, being this extraordinarily neuroplastic organ, has all these feedback uh, mechanisms. And so what happens is if you go on a stimulant, the brain says, uh-oh, this dopamine is staying too long in the synaptic cleft, and we need to compensate for that. And so how does it compensate for that? It tries to put down the break on dopaminergic transmission. So the drug acts as an accelerator, the brain puts down the break, and it does so in two ways. The presynaptic neurons put out less dopamine than normal, at least for a while, and the receiving neurons, the postsynaptic neurons, decrease the density of their receptors for dopamine. Okay? And what researchers say is the brain is trying to maintain its homeostatic equilibrium, its normal functioning. Now, one small thing here. So stimulants work in basically the exact same, well, especially methylphenidate, which is Ritalin, works in the same way that cocaine does. So cocaine blocks the reuptake of, of, of dopamine from that synaptic cleft. Methylphenidate does the same thing, actually with the same potency. The big difference between cocaine and, and methylphenidate, Ritalin, is methylphenidate is longer lasting. In other words, it stays in your body for a longer period of time. Cocaine is cleared faster, and that's often why you, you sort of have this craving for it, because it gets cleared from the body. But the mechanism is, is, is the same, and the potency is the same. Anyway, we talked about this compensatory adaptation. And one of the things that I think is key here is Stephen, and you know, I, I know this is a different metaphor for understanding how drugs work, because you've been told they sort of are, they fix chemical imbalances in the brain. We've, we've heard this about the drugs. We turn on our TV and, for example, you look at antidepressants. They say, oh, you have low serotonin, the drug fixes that low serotonin, and now you're so happy you're, you're walking on a beach with a beautiful woman. I think we've all seen that one. That's just a false metaphor. And in 1996, Stephen Hyman, who's a neuroscientist who was at, at that time, um, the director of the National Institute of Mental Health, which is our federal agency for conducting research on mental disorders, wrote a paper on understanding how psychiatric drugs act on the brain, such as stimulants. And what he says is this, he says these drugs work by perturbing neurotransmitter systems in the brain. 
That's what we just talked about with the stimulants. They block that normal reuptake. He says in response to that perturbation, the brain undergoes these compensatory adaptations, which is just what we talked about with stimulants. The presynaptic neurons put out less dopamine, and the receiving neurons reduce the density of the receptors. And he's seeing says this. And he says, at the end of this process, you're causing substantial and long-lasting alterations in neural function, which means this is a profound thing to do to a child's brain. And he says, at the end, the brain is operating in a manner that is both qualitatively and quantitatively different than normal. Now, that is a, a metaphor or an understanding of how drugs work that really reverses our understanding. These, in fact, these medications for kids are not normalizing agents, they're abnormalizing agents, okay? Now, this does not tell us anything about whether the drugs are effective or not. It just, it just puts a different understanding in terms of what we're doing to the child. But I will say this. I think once you understand that and you go back to Stephen Himes and he says long la substantial and long-lasting alterations in neural function, you can see that that's a profound thing to do. And now as we turn ourselves to the science, we're going to want to see science that shows that this indeed is helpful for children over the long term. Does that make sense? Because it is a profound intervention. Now, the first thing you want to do, of course, when we have drugs is we test them over the short term and we have a target symptom. So the target symptoms of ADHD, what are they? Kids are too fidgety, they talk too much, they're disruptive in class, etc. You give them stimulants, you give them Ritalin, and indeed they become less fidgety. They will speak less, so they're less of a disturbance in the classroom. And they will focus especially on sort of routine tasks that can really sort of focus, um, say, like on certain sort of arithmetic problems, et cetera. So based on those outcome measures, when you give kids stimulants, they are seen as causing a change in behavior that, that is desirable, okay? And that's why, in essence, they are seen as having a short-term efficacy. And you can see here, this is what the NIMH investigators are summarizing here. These drugs are effective in that way over the short term. Now, one of the things I wanted to do in this book, though, was look at also larger description of what happens to children when they're placed on these medications, okay, in, in terms of their behavior. And you'll see here in this slide, these are just some early observations in the 70s when they were first using stimulants about what do we see in these kids? Okay, they do move around less, they talk around less, but you'll see, here's Russell Barkley. There's a marked drug-related increase in solitary play and a corresponding reduction in their initiation of social interactions. The drug reduces a child's curiosity about the environment. The child loses his sparkle. Medicated children often become passive, submissive, and socially withdrawn. Then finally, this last one, you can see this is a mainstream book. These stimulants work by reducing the amount of behavioral responses to the environment. All I'm saying is this is, in, in a way, that's what the short-term studies show, right? You talk less, you interact less, et cetera. But when you get these descriptions, you can raise the question, was well, this really good for the child? It's just a different way of thinking about the change being caused by the drug. Now, again, we said the diagnosis happens so often in a school environment. These children aren't really thriving in school. That's basically the reason. So what we're hoping to see, of course, is an improvement in academic achievement. And here were from the first sort of responses by psychologists that sought to measure, are we improving academic achievement in the 70s, et cetera. And you can see it enhances performance on rep repetitive, routinized, routinized tasks that required sustained attention, but reasoning, problem solving, and learning do not seem to be positively affected. Next one. Ritalin does not produce any benefit on the student's vocabulary, reading, spelling, or math, and hinders their ability to solve problems. The reactions of the children strongly suggest a reduction in commitment of the sort that would seem critical for learning. The major effect of stimulants appears to be an improvement in classroom manageability rather than academic performance. Now these are not, these are impressions. These are not, these are not study data. We're going to have to see if the study data, it, it, it backs that up. These are just initial impressions, okay? Because of though these, the, the, after the first decade, so if you look at the use of stimulants, they were used some in the 1970s, but then it really takes off after the, it's added to the DSM-3 in 1980, and then in DSM-3R in 87, and the amount of Ritalin prescribed and stimulants prescribed goes way up. So in 1994, the American Psychiatric Association in its textbook of psychiatry talked about 
What have we learned so far about these medications and their effect on long-term outcomes? Okay? And here's what they said. Stimulants do not produce lasting improvements in aggressivity, conduct disorder, criminality, education achievement, achievement job functioning, marital relationships, or long-term adjustment. So what the American Psychiatric Association is saying, after basically 14 years of this, is we're not seeing any long-term benefit. We have the short-term benefit of maybe making the kid more manageable in the classroom, but we're not seeing that this is helping that child grow up and thrive. Now because of that, at that point, the NIMH mounted a study to really assess, do these medications help children over the long term? This study, which is known as the multi-site, multimodal treatment study of children, is still seen as the best randomized study we have of long-term outcomes. And when it was mounted, you'll see that the NIMH said, this is the first real clinical trial we have of a childhood mental disorder. They, they acknowledged at the outset, we do not have evidence at this time that stimulants produce a long-term benefit on any domain of functioning. This is their language, not mine. So this was the study really meant for us as a society. Are we helping children when we put them on stimulants long term? And the study had four arms. They were randomized either into drug alone, but, but drugs prescribed by really experts in the field, behavioral therapy, drug plus behavioral therapy, or some people just sent to an ordinary practitioner in the community, okay? Those are the four arms. And at the end of 14 months, there was a positive announcement for the medication, okay? The ADHD symptoms, those core ADHD symptoms, were reduced more in the medication group. That's number one. And there did seem some benefit on reading as well. So when this, this finding came out, you see that the NIMH says, we finally have some evidence we're improving these children beyond, say, six weeks, which is those shorter term trials. We now have a evidence of a benefit at 14 months. And you see the researchers say, uh, since ADHD is now regarded by most experts as a chronic disorder, ongoing treatment often seems necessary. So this is the science that says, now we have some reason for keeping these children on medications beyond six weeks, okay? Now at the end of 14 months, they continued to follow these kids for another eight years. And at the end of 14 months, it's just a naturalistic study. So if a kid has been on meds, they may go off, or well, generally they stayed on, or if you're not on meds, you could go on, okay? But then we're just gonna follow these kids, and we're gonna measure how they're doing at three years and six years. Now here's what they reported at the end of three years. This result, by the way, was publicized quite a bit to the public. This result was not. You can read it. So what did they find at the end of three years? Medication use was a significant marker, not of beneficial outcome, but of deterioration. That is, participants using medication in the 24 to 36 month period actually showed increased symptomatology during that interval relative to those not taking medication. Medicated children were also slightly smaller and had higher delinquency scores. So here we see a different understanding. Over a longer period, we're starting to see a paradoxical result, right? That instead of, the, instead of this continued benefit, for some reason with longer use, actually the core symptoms get worse compared to those off medication. Now one thing that's important to understand, and sometimes when I give this talk I realize it can be confusing. It's not that the medicated children at the end of 36 months had worse ADHD symptoms than they did at the beginning of the study at baseline, okay? They were still better off on those scales. The point is relative to those off medication they deteriorated and that's partly because those off medication were getting so much better, okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Because people say, hey, my kid's better than they went, than he first went on. Well, that may be true, but what you're really doing in these studies, it's a relative assessment, okay? Now, here's the six-year results from the MTA study. You can read them as well. At the end of six years, medication use was associated with worse hyperactivity, impulsivity, and oppositional defiant disorder symptoms, and with greater overall functional impairment. Was this, a, did you hear this publicized in any of our papers? Do you, if you go on the NIMH website, do you think this is on there right now? Do you think the APA publicizes it on its website? This really is the problem we have, is that when we get results like this, it doesn't get publicized. And it doesn't get discussed, and it doesn't get, well, what is the meaning of this? And how might this affect how we use these medications and think about them? But you can see here, at the end of six years, 
the medicated children were doing worse than those who had gotten off the medications or never been put on them in the first place. Now, at the end of eight years, there, were, there had been so many dropouts, there was no statistically significant difference between those on medication and off medication. But here is the conclusion from uh, one of the lead investigators about what we learned from this study about long-term benefits of stimulants for children diagnosed with ADHD. And this actually is why I wanted to use the slide so you can see his words and you can see it's not me making this uh, conclusion. This is the conclusion that came from your, you, you all paid for this study. It was an NIMH government funded study and they said we had thought that children medicated longer would have better outcomes. That didn't happen to be the case. There were no beneficial effects, none. In the short term, medication will help the child behave better. In the long run, it won't. And that information should be made very clear to parents. And you could see why, if you're a parent and you have a seven-year-old who's recommended for stimulants, I think your kid has attention deficit disorder, you, you would want to know this information. And it would be part of your own decision process of whether or not to go down this route. But th I can guarantee you, no parent today is given this information. And this is the study that was done and paid for by the American people to figure out are we helping these kids over the long term? But because it didn't give the result they wanted, it's not part of the information given to parents. So now let's go forward. That's the, that is the best randomized study out there, but let's look what other investigators have concluded that have tried to answer this question. Do these medications improve long-term outcomes in this group? So there was a Canadian group that assess the literature and they, and they looked through all this, they looked through 14 studies that really focused on academic achievement. You can see it's 1400 youth and what did they conclude? There's little evidence for improved academic performance with stimulants. So this sort of reflects the finding in the MTA study. Now there's another, this is the biggest sort of canvas of the literature I know. The Oregon Health and Science University, is, uh, this drug effectiveness review project, it's centered at Oregon Health and Science University, but it involves investigators from 13 universities. They do not take pharmaceutical money. So what they did at this time in 2005, they went through all the literature out there, all the efforts to assess the effect of stimulants on children so diagnosed to see, can we find in science evidence that we're helping these kids? and you can see what they concluded. There is no good quality evidence on the use of drugs to affect outcomes related to global academic performance, consequences of risky behaviors, social achievements, etc. So this is 25 years after we began doing this. We still don't have that evidence. Now the other country that has done a pretty good long-term study was a, actually a district in Western Australia. They looked at, uh, they had two groups of kids. Everybody has ADHD, one group is put on meds, the other group is not put on meds, they're followed for 10 years, and what did they report? First of all, the medicated children were much more likely to be identified by teachers as performing at below age level, you know, what is appropriate for their grade. You saw a small bit of worse ADHD symptoms in the medicated group, which is consistent with the MTA study, remember what we saw at three and six years, worse impulsivity, etc. They had elevated blood pressure, and so what is the conclusion that Western Australia came to after their 10-year study? Well, this is their language. Medication does not translate into long-term benefits to the child's social and emotional outcomes, school-based performance, or symptom improvement. So Australia came to the same conclusion that the Oregon people did, and that was seen in the MTA study. This is more recent stuff. There was a recent one-year study looking at uh, children uh, in Medicaid put on um, ADHD drugs. You'll see no difference at the end of one year between the two. However, look at this. Compa if you, compared with children receiving no care, children in especially mental health clinics were more likely to have fi high functional impairment at six and 12 month follow-ups. Again, not a benefit. So now let's take a, a deep breath. It's 2010. What I have tried to do in this brief 10, 15 minutes is, is, is hit all the landmark efforts in our science that sought to assess, are we helping these kids grow up long term? And you saw what happened time and time again, is that even the eight core ADHD symptoms don't end up reduced. We don't see improved academic performance. 
We don't see benefits on any domain of functioning. And here's why this is so, I think, upsetting. Think of drugs. Every drug hopefully has a benefit and it has risks, right? It has possible risks of adverse events. And as we weigh to use these drugs, our hope, our expectation is the benefits will outweigh the risks, right? That's, it's, we, we've got to see that. What they're saying, what this science is telling us, is that over the long term, we haven't been able to find anything on the benefit side of the, the, the ledger. And unfortunately, if you don't have anything on the benefit side, what are you left with? The risks, the possible adverse events. So now we have to look at, well, what are some of the adverse events related with uh, the use of stimulants? Well, physical, drowsiness, appetite loss, lethargy, insomnia, headaches, etc. You can read, there's a long list of, of, of possible side effects with this. You'll see physical tics, etc. Emotional. Now think about, imagine you go on a stimulant. You're adults. What's your day going to be like? You go on a stimulant. You're going to be aroused, right? Stimulants are arousal drugs. What happens if you drink a lot of coffee and then you stop drinking coffee? You crash a bit, right? So you go into an arousal state and then you go into a dysphoric state. You're actually setting up a real cycle going on. But anyway, some of the emotional side effects include depression, apathy, a general dullness, mood swings, crying jags, irritability, anxiety, and a sense of hostility. Psychiatric symptoms, you do see risks. OCD symptoms, mania, paranoia, psychotic episodes, and hallucinations. And by the way, if you see these risks, what happens if you have a psychotic episode? What, what happens to your diagnosis? Do you remain diagnosed with ADHD? No, you get diagnosed with bipolar or schizoaffective or something like that. So what happens you actually, and we'll go into this in a second, what happens you see in these risks of adverse psychiatric events is a possible pathway where you have a kid who's fidgety in class at age six, seven, goes on these drugs, has a manic episode or a psychotic episode or starts cycling up and down and ends up with a much more serious diagnosis. So you can see that that is a real risk. You're going to take that otherwise healthy kid, we didn't find any pathology in the brain, and next thing you know, Four or five years later, they got a bipolar diagnosis, et cetera. And here's the other thing. And I just saw this interview today with Alan Francis. Alan Francis was the architect. He's a psychiatrist that really was behind dsm 4 So he was one of the, the lead figure with dsm 4 And he says, going on a psychiatric drug is a profound thing. And he compared it to getting married. You should be as cautious about going on a psychiatric drug as you when you pick your spouse. Now, why does he say this? It's because once you go on, your brain compensates, right? It adapts to the presence of the drug, and now coming off is going to be difficult. So think about this. You go on, let's say, a stimulant, and stimulants probably are some of the easier drugs to come off. That ups dopamine. Your brain puts down the accelerator. Now take away the drug. What do you got? You've actually got this desensitized dopamine system, which can lead to withdrawal symptoms, et cetera. And the other thing that is becoming uh, somewhat clear is that, let's say you go off the drug. Now, you've, you've, the drug has made you have a reduced density of dopamine receptors. Does that renormalize when, when you go off the drug? It was always thought that it would, but there's some evidence now with psychiatric drugs not necessarily so. That what happens is the drugs, they're a stressor that cause a change in gene expression. Gene expression forms, determines how many proteins are made, such as the receptor densities. And that once the genes reset, just because you remove the drug it doesn't mean you now have a stressor that causes the receptor densities to renormalize. Now, this is still you know, being investigated, needs more investigation. Now, I think there is some research that shows at times it does renormalize. But there's also some research that shows at the risk that it won't, which tells you why this can be so profound. So the next thing I want to, and you can see where, I hope you can see the organization of this talk. Okay, we talked about what was learned about how the diagnosis arose. Then we looked to see, do we know of any sort of pathology? Then we looked to see on the benefit side, what did they find, especially over the long term? And now we're really focusing on the, the, the risk side of the equation, okay? And we just talked about this. And when you want to look at the risk side of the equation, one of the places you may get that information is, of course, looking at animal studies, right? So if you look at animal studies, and you'll see, like, when, if you put monkeys on stimulants, especially when they're young, you'll see that as adults they exhibit aberrant behaviors, okay, that their behavior has changed. Rats, the second one is, is actually um, more worrisome than it might see. 
So you give rats in puberty stimulants, and what happens to the adult rats? They're less curious than normal. They're less reward-seeking. Now, dopamine is the reward molecule. We like dopamine release. It's one of the things that gets us to be curious and take risks. And the, the worry here is, I'm not saying it's established or anything like that, but the worry from this is, with the stimulants, you drive the dopamine system into this desensitized state, then the kid grows up, and actually they just don't have a full-powered dopamine system, and that's one of the reasons that you might see less curiosity than normal. This is a rat study. I don't know any, adult, any study in humans that replicates that, but I also don't know any study that's looked at it either. Okay? It's just a worry arising from this rat study. And you'll see finally there's also this thing, this deficit in sexual behavior among the uh, rats if they're placed on stimulants. And again, this sense that you're, you're affecting behaviors in adulthood. Okay, so what are the long-term risks with stimulants that I would be most worried about? I think this desensitized dopamine system, it's a possibility. I don't think it's really uh, well understood or well established, but I would be worried about it. But this is the real big worry. It's this. If you follow children diagnosed with ADHD for a longer period of time, say two to four years, somewhere to between 10 and 25 percent convert to bipolar. Now, in, 19, in 1980, juvenile bipolar disorder was seen as bipolar disorder was seen as not existing in kids. Okay, bipolar disorder was seen as uh, something that happened post puberty. Okay, it was, a, it was a disorder of the developed person. And, and, and you can look, when they looked in the, say, 1960, 1970, they, they would say, do we see manic depressive illness in children? And they say, no, we don't see it. And then the very first case study is done in like in 1976, 1977, and this doctor says, I have seen manic depressive illness in, in children. And he gives, I think it's five case studies. In those five case studies, either three or four had been exposed to stimulants or antidepressants. Then the next one was done at, Mass I think it was Massachusetts General Hospital. They had more case studies, and I think this was 1978, and it was like eight of 11 had been exposed to stimulants or to antidepressants. And then the third one at this time was done, I think it was 1981-82, I think it was UCLA. They had a larger group of people, kids on stimulants, that had gone manic, had psychotic episodes, so they saw this route going from ADHD to manic depressive illness. And at this point, they basically said, well, <laughs> the stimulants maybe are unmasking a bipolar disorder that already, already existed in the children. But the point was, it would never used to get unmasked, so to speak. You understand what I'm saying there? So it was a way to sort of save the image of the drugs by saying that, it was always there and we're just unmasking it, but it didn't used to get unmasked. And today, if you, for example, look, if we had 100 kids in here with bipolar disorder, right, that's diagnosed, you would find very, very many had their first psychotic or manic episode while on a stimulant or an antidepressant. In fact, there was one study done, I think, at, at the New York City Clinic, it's called the FEDA Clinic of Bipolar Youth. 83% of those youth had had an, another diagnosis rather than bipolar and were put on a psychiatric drug be, before they went bipolar. And it's really easy to, there's really two risks with stimulants as to why you grease this pathway from, from ADHD to bipolar. One is they can cause psychotic symptoms, okay? And amphetamine, amphetamine is a stimulant, I mean methamphetamine is a stimulant. Amphetamine induced psychosis, that's a well-known risk going back to the 50s and 60s. The college kids were taking, and every once in a while they'd show up at the emergency room psychotic. Now, I, it's ho there's all sorts of reports in MedWatch that have been given also to the Drug Enforcement Agency of youth having psychotic episodes manic in, after going on stimulants. I don't see a good quantification of this risk. Okay, sometimes you'll see it as 1% of kids, sometimes you'll see 5%. I don't know exactly how serious that risk is of having a psychotic episode is. But a greater risk is this. Imagine, I mean, if you go on to the NIMH website and you look at the symptoms of bipolar, juvenile bipolar, they'll have arousal symptoms and they'll have dysphoric symptoms, okay? And now you look at the known side effects of stimulants and you have arousal 
side effects and you have dysphoric symptoms. And they track right on top of each other. So the known adverse effects, arousal dysphoric of stimulants, are the very symptoms used to diagnose uh, bipolar disorder. So you can see why you would have this risk of sliding from ADHD to bipolar. Again, it's, and this is in two to four years. I, I really would like to know what happens over the course of 15, 20 years. But here's, think about this risk. You have this child, say age six, seven, fidgeting too much in class, and maybe not doing so well in classroom. If they move to bipolar, they're now seen as having a really serious disorder, a lifelong disorder. And with bipolar, you'll get other drugs. You'll get uh, mood stabilizers. You might get lithium. You might be put on antipsychotic medications. So here is data, I believe, that really tells of the possibility of, of really harming that child, right? And in fact, it's data that says many children have been so harmed because we didn't used to see bipolar disorder, and now we're seeing it supposedly juvenile bipolar is something like one in every 50 kids or something crazy like that. But this is a story of a possible pathway to what you would call an iatrogenic caused illness. Iatrogenic meaning treatment caused. So this, I think, is one of the real risks we see with stimulants. So now let's, uh, let's um, sort of summarize what we see. So again, we want to look at benefits and risks, right? And sometimes I think risks, we maybe should <laughs> call them harms. But what do we know about the benefits? Well, the data seems to show that these drugs are highly effective in changing behavior over the short term in ways that will make that child more acceptable in the classroom, OK? In other words, they'll talk less, and maybe they will focus better on certain tasks. They'll be less disruptive, and that behavior change is seen as good. And the second one here, the possible short-term improvement in reading, of course, comes from the, that MTA study, which said after 14 months, maybe the kids were doing better in reading. But now we have to look at possible harms, and especially over the long term. And what do we see? No benefit on any uh, domain of functioning, OK? Compared to those unmedicated. And what's happening is those unmedicated are getting better. That's what we have to understand, OK? It's a relative comparison. You have all these physical, emotional, and, and psychiatric adverse effects. I talked about the risks that the brain's dopaminergic system will become desensitized. This, I think, is a big thing because it means maybe you're not going to experience as much joy in life. Again, it's speculative. And then you have this risk of this drug-induced conversion to juvenile bipolar disorder. And when this happens, you've created basically a, a mental patient. You've, this child now has a career of a mental patient laid out before them. Now, and again, I want to, again, one of the reasons I do use the graphics, because I want you to see the words of other researchers on this. Now, Alan Sroof, you'll see he's Professor Emeritus of Psychology at the University of Minnesota. He's been studying this for 40 years. He initially was a believer in stimulants, OK? This is not a critic. This is not an outsider. And in 2012, he wrote this for the New York Times. And listen to this. Attention deficit drugs increase concentration in the short term, which is why they work so well for college students cramming for exams. And we all know that they use them. But when given to children over long periods of time, that's the key, long periods of time, they neither improve school achievement nor reduce behavior problems. To date, no study, and this is 30 some years after we began using these drugs, has found any long term benefit of attention deficit medication on academic performance peer relationships or behavior problems, the very things we would want most to improve. The drugs can also have serious side effects, including stunting growth. Now, again, why I want this is so important is if, if I come out here as a journalist and, and were to make these statements, you'd say, this guy's a crank. Come on. But this is someone who knows the literature. And you can see why he made this conclusion, because you've seen all the stepping stones to it. You've seen the, the, the initial. 14 years when the APA said we don't have the evidence. You saw the MTA study. You saw the Canadians look through the literature. You saw Oregon look through the year literature. And time and time again, this is what they were concluding. Now, I recently was giving this talk at um, the Bush School, a very well sort of private school in Seattle. And right from the beginning, there was 
one person in particular who was very unhappy with his talk. <laughs> and he basically interrupted me at one point and said, this is terrible, there's plenty of studies that show benefits, etc. And I had been watching him on his phone, actually, and I saw that he had gone on, you know, the internet to find a study that showed a benefit. And he said, there's a Swedish study out there that shows that the drugs reduce criminality, okay? Now, I'll be honest with you, I didn't know the Swedish study at that time. It was just published in 2012. So I went back and looked at it, and, and so this is, there's going to be two studies that are now being pointed to as evidence that these drugs improve long-term outcomes. Okay, so what did the Swedes do? Swedes have a national health registry, so they can see everybody who's diagnosed, and they can also see medication use. So they looked at all those 15 and older who had a diagnosis of ADHD, and then they looked at their medication use for the next three years, and then they looked, at, so they knew hopefully when they were on medication and when they were off medication, and they found that during periods off medication, they seemed to commit more crimes, okay? And there was basically this 31% uh, increase in um, crimes when they were off the meds. And so you can see the conclusion here, okay? But, so I looked at the study. Here's the problem with the study. There's actually three groups of people in this study. There's those who took medications consistently, very few. And again, it's 15 and older, by the way. And then there's a group that went on and off. Okay, they're on sometimes, and then they go off, and then they go back on. And then there was this large group that didn't use stimulants at all for the, for the, for the four years. If you want to figure out if the medications may be reducing criminality rate, you know what you want? You want, the, you want the crime rate for each of these three groups. And the reason you want them for each of these three groups is because going on and off medications, whether they be stimulants or others, is a problematic thing to do. Because what happens is when you go off, symptoms flare up. In fact, if we went back to this one with, uh, whoops. Oh, here, you see this upon withdrawal. ADHD symptoms are known to get worse, okay, when you come off the medications. So my point is, and, and they even found in this study, um, it was during this time when they moved between, it was in these patients who had both these treatment and non-treatment periods, the second group, they were the ones with the higher risk of crime. And I will say, generally with psychiatric drugs, if you see people are going on and off, that's a really problematic course. But what we really want to know is, what sort of crime rate was in those who were never on the medication or during that time? And unfortunately, it doesn't give us that data. Okay? Now, here's the second study that was just pointed out to me. I was in a little, uh, sometimes, as you might imagine, I get emails from all over. And there's someone named DJ Jaffe, who's the head of something called the Treatment, Ab or he helped co-founded the Treatment Advocacy Center. It's a group that is very much in favor of medications, sometimes even laws uh, to force people to take medications, such as antipsychotics. And he was sort of taking me to task on the internet, saying, there is a study out there. Whitaker says there's no studies showing long-term benefits. There is one. And this is the study he was pointing to. So I looked at the study. It's a brand new study. Okay, it's done by Shire Pharmaceuticals. Now, who is Shire Pharmaceuticals? They make ADHD drugs, okay? They make Adderall, they make, uh, uh, I can't even pronounce it, Intuniv or whatever it is, but this is what they do, okay? So they funded this study. Their medical director was the lead investigator. Now, if you go this, they say they canvassed the same literature that Oregon canvassed, and unlike Oregon, they found some benefit, okay? And they found, they said, <laughs> they looked through all of it, they looked through all the studies and they found 29 reports where there was some improvement on some outcome measure, okay? And there was only 20 reports of no benefit or worse outcomes for treated ADHD. So they concluded treatment for ADHD improved long-term outcomes. Listen, here's what I gotta say. You can take the Oregon stuff, or you can take the Shire Pharmaceutical stuff. They're looking at the same literature, all right? And they've come to different conclusions. Now, one of the things, by the way, that, that you can see some of the bias in this study is one of, the, one of the ways they called untreated ADHD, they wouldn't actually in these studies even have anybody with untreated ADHD. What they would have is people treated with ADHD, and then they'd compare them to their baseline rates, and they'd say, well, they're better than when they were untreated, so that shows that they're better than untreated. But, you know, that's a ridiculous comparison. You have to have, like, 
some sense of natural recovery, et cetera. Anyway, those are the only two studies that have been pointed out to me as contradicting uh, this larger story I've been telling you. And I think this is important to see. I'm not cherry picking the data. I'm not selectively doing the data. I've tried to present a full-bodied story for you all here today. Now, I just want to look at this one thing. This is not exactly a, a straight to this. So it's in, in 1987, there were 16,200 children on disability due to mental illness. In other words, they received an S Social Security payment, SSI payments. Now, what did we start doing in 1987? We started really medicating our kids. Okay, we started using, um, and what did we start medicating? We started medicating the boys in particular with stimulants, and then actually beginning in the early 1990s, we began medicating the girls with antidepressants, especially teenage girls. Now, I could tell you a story about teen what happens on antidepressants, but there's also a risk of converting to bipolar. Anyway, what you now see is this extraordinary rise in the number of children on uh, disability due to mental illness. So we went from 16,200 to more than 600, well, in 2007 it was slightly under 600,000. Now we're more than 700,000 children. So as we've embraced this diagnosing of children and putting on medications, we're seeing this extraordinary rise in kids who are said to be mentally ill early on. And if you follow these kids who get on disability as children, about two-thirds when they hit age 18 go on to adult disability. So what has opened up in our society is really a new pathway. And it's a pathway where kids get diagnosed, they get put on these psychoactive drugs, and at least a percentage of them end up now as career mental patients. So that's the sort of nice, tightly control, you know, constrained story of ADHD, where it came from, how it's diagnosed, what we know about the biology, how the drugs affect the brain, and what the science tells us. And here's my final words, or thoughts. You know, from my point of view as a journalist, my job is just try to make information known, right? And especially this information is not really well known by the public. And what I would hope is this information could be disseminated and talked about in school circles by school counselors, and then we could have a societal discussion much more informed about diagnosing kids with ADHD, does it benefit them, and how to use these drugs, and when to use these drugs, and should we be using these drugs long term. So that's really my hope, is that new information would lead to a sort of a more considered consideration of what we're doing to our children with this paradigm of care. Thank you. OK, so I assume that most of the stuff you've looked at have got ample sample sizes, and you're convinced most of the data is reliable. I'm convinced it's the best yeah. data we have. Sure. So why would someone rehashing this come out with different data? Is it to increase the sample size or to do a program where you put kids on a, a short period and then put them off and try to see what the benefits are? Well, listen, I mean, first of all, we've been doing this for 30 years. Yeah. And in, after 30 years, you saw what Alan Sruf said. We just don't have studies showing uh, that we're improving these kids' lives long term, okay? And that point is it comes up again and again with different studies, different sample sizes, et cetera. So why don't we change? In other words, why don't prescribing practices respond to this? I don't have a great answer for that, except this. You know, psychiatry as a profession in 1980 basically ceded talk therapy to psychologists and to social workers, et cetera. And if you look at the products psychiatry had after 1980 with this manual, it was really threefold. Research, diagnosis, and drugs, okay? Now, if they start saying, and, and they told us a story basically of how these disorders are brain disorders, and the, and the, the idea was that the drugs in some manner or another fix those brain disorders sort of like antibiotics, right? Well, they've needed to maintain that story, basically for the protection of guild interests. Now, those guild interests also obviously um, fit well with the interests of pharmaceutical companies. And they're joined in this way. Pharmaceutical companies, beginning in the 1980s, began hiring academic psychiatrists to be speakers, consultants, and advisors. 
Now, they did not continue to get those lucrative deals if they spoke out negatively about the drugs. So basically, you had a money flow that really f was pushing a story along about how these drugs are good, they fix things, and that produced a great economic benefit. If we start saying that these drugs provide no benefit over the long term, say stimulants for kids, do you think parents would use them so much? You would really curb this, right? Yeah. And so you're curbing an economic activity. And, you're, and not only that, you're denting a story. You're putting a hole in a story that is so important to academic psychiatry and the pharmaceutical companies. Because if the stimulants aren't good for kids, well, maybe the antidepressants aren't good for kids. It opens up a whole bit of doubt. And, and really what has happened is, is academic psychiatry and the APA in league with pharmaceutical companies have been very effective about telling us a certain story. And what you find as a journalist, when you look at the science, it doesn't add up with the story that's told, but that's the story that's told. And actually, it's, it's hard to contradict it. You can be sort of marginalized, and it goes against economic interest. The problem is it's causing great social harm that we don't have this information. And one of the things I did in this book, Anatomy of an Epidemic, is I looked at every, across different diagnostic categories. I identified 16 long-term studies of different things, schizophrenia, bipolar, et cetera, depression, that really that compared outcomes over the long term for medicated and unmedicated patients. I know you're going to seem surprised by this, but time and time again, the unmedicated patients did better on the whole, and that was even true for schizophrenia. I know that seems hard to believe, but the recovery rate was eight times higher for the unmedicated patients. Employment rates were many, many times higher. Do you think any of those 16 studies were publicized, even though they were funded by the NIMH or the Canadian government? None of them got publicized. You didn't read about any of them in the New York Times, Washington Post, et cetera. Now, I don't blame the New York Times. It's the point is that when they get these bad results, they don't send out the press release and say, uh-oh, we have this problem. But that's really the problem we have here. We have an information problem in this country. Because the information that you all hear and parents hear is a certain story designed to protect this, this mode of care and the selling of these drugs. And when we get data like this, it just doesn't get out there. But for me, I know I'm really long-winded here, what is so compelling to me is, you, one of the reasons I wanted to tell the history here is, did you see how it happened time and time again? 1994, we don't have it. MTA, we don't have it. Canadian, we're not seeing it. Uh, Oregon, we don't see it. It's, it's, it's like rep repetitious. And what happens during that time? The use of ADHD drugs just goes up and up and up. And it seems like, well, we say we're an we, medicine is evidence-based. Well, I don't believe it. Because when the evidence doesn't fit with what we want, we just ignore it or we hide it, et cetera. And all I got to say is, I think we betray our children when we don't make this information known. I really do. Recommendations. I'm just wondering what advice you have for social workers and psychologists that are working in those kind of, the, those kind of situations where we have your book. Yeah. We don't have the, the power to, to override what other people are doing. So this is a really great question, and I get this question a lot. And the answer is I don't know. What, what happens is within systems, you know, systems operate within a belief system. That's number one. And people who don't get in line with the belief system often don't thrive in that system. And we even have a reimbursement system that is built around insurance reimbursement, about around diagnosis and, frankly, medicating, et cetera. So there's a larger social current, there's sort of a river flowing along. And how are you going to stop that river? It's really, really hard. And it's all I can say is, you know, so this book was published three years ago, and I have been on the road a lot since talking to different groups. The only way, I think, for an individual to really try to turn things a little bit is to make this information part of a discussion for the group as a whole, is, is basically try to put it on the, on, the, on, the, on the agenda for the psychiatrists, for the social workers, and make them try to confront their own data. I mean, it is their data. It, you know, it's, it's, these studies weren't done by, in fact, psychologists. These studies were done by psychiatrists, okay, these medication studies. It's their data. And the only way you can start seeing turn things is try to get a larger group, including those on the 
belief side to confront this data.